In the first chapter of Realism Overhaul, we've navigated our way through the early game, from tiny missiles that couldn't even reach space, to the first Kerbal landing on the moon. And that crazy lunar landing is now the final brick of the foundation for the next chapter, entering mid-game. We have so much more ahead of us, and I'm eager to get started. But what I'd like to do first is establish our goals and give us a sense of direction. See, until now we've been floundering and barely scraping by, and that's been a lot of fun. But we've also had a close call or two that could have ended the entire playthrough had we not been just a little bit lucky. Now that we're out, the game is really beginning to open up. Plain and simple, my goal in Realism Overhaul is to explore as much of the solar system as possible. Specifically, as the end goal, I would like to plant a flag on every single terrestrial body in the game, even as far as Pluto, at the edge of the solar system. An objective that tall will always be the culmination of many much smaller steps, some of those steps a bit more successful than others. Along the way, we're sure to see many sweet successes and bitter failures, but we will push ahead through Kraken attacks and low frame rates until the game itself breaks entirely or we just so happen to reach our goal. And I'm sure as hell glad you've decided to come with me on this journey. So here's to you, and here's to the second chapter of Realism Overhaul. Let's begin. First of all, it's time to check in on Hermes 1, as right now it is approaching a descending node in relation to Venus. This spacecraft was launched three years ago in 1971. Its active mission was to complete a very close flyby of the planet Mercury, and this was successful. It's worth noting that this was the first probe to reach Mercury, in fact the first probe to even attempt the feat. And now, Hermes has entered its passive mission phase basically drifting endlessly in the void, and if possible, go wherever we want it to go. Well, an opportunity has arisen to fly past Venus as well all this time later, and we just so happen to have a big ol' SRB strapped to the bottom of this spacecraft. So we might as well put it to good use. It looks like the solid can give us a pretty sizable boost, and we can use the onboard thrusters for the final inclination adjustment pretty easily. The motor lights up, and the solid fuel burns away. And then we take a look at the map view again, and realize that I completely burned the opposite direction I was supposed to. Well, as chat suggested, we'll just blame the interns for a software miscompution and accept the fact that, well, it's unlikely Hermes will encounter any other planets anytime soon. Not a big loss, since the science experiments on board probably wouldn't have taught us anything new about Venus anyway, given its three-year-old technology and all. But still, not a great way to kick off the second chapter now, is it? now 1974. Controversy over the safety and necessity of the space program as a whole has led to us being kicked out of the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Allegedly, the close calls during the Lucky 7 mission were the final straw for the United States, who will no longer facilitate our endeavors. No matter, now entirely privately funded, a brand new launch facility has been erected overnight on an artificial island constructed off the coast of Florida. It's here I'd like to introduce a mostly new launch vehicle called Meteor. Sporting a solid 5 tons to low Earth orbit, its first stage is the side booster of the now discontinued MXL line of launch vehicles. With some old boosters just lying around collecting dust, I figure we might as well get some use out of them. 
Two flights are scheduled for this year, both identical vehicles. Their main objective will be to collect data on two brand new engines in preparations for the ambitions of the coming years. The second stage consists of one LR87 LH2 vacuum engine, and the payload utilizes a single lunar module ascent engine. Rather than simply gathering reliability data on the engines, we're going to attempt to take the payload into a geostationary orbit. Not only to give our new meteor something more substantial to do, but also in all honesty, it's about time we replaced the rather sporadic array of squawk communication satellites that were launched in 1967. Geostationary orbit is a much better place for communication satellites to reside, and the test article happens to have enough delta V to pull it off. Now I definitely did not reach a perfect geostationary orbit here. As you can see, there is quite a lot of wobbling back and forth in relation to a fixed point on the surface of the Earth. I'm confident a more stable trajectory can definitely be reached here, but the parameters are just close enough that I'll leave fussing with it more to an unscheduled time in the future. As mentioned previously, we launched two of these spacecraft, and both were successful. For now, they are placed above opposite points on the Earth, providing a fantastic range of coverage for communications. Squawk is two steps closer to being phased out completely, and a new program is established for all things geostationary, called Constellation. More Constellation satellites will likely be designed in the future, most likely a proper satellite design, rather than what we have here, which is basically a test article for lunar technology. But, you know, despite how weird it sorta of looks, it, it served the purpose of a test article just fine, and it does what we needed it to do. This is a brand new launch vehicle called Comet. The first stage consists of a single mighty F1 engine. Yeah, we've unlocked some better tech since last episode, that's for sure. The upper stage is the exact same stage flown on the Meteor, now with some additional reliability data thanks to the previous two flights. Its payload is a spacecraft called Cosmos. Well, we're launching three of them to be exact. Three space probes launched on three separate rockets, that is. At some point during 1974, we just so happened to come across launch windows for both Jupiter and Saturn, and since we have bigger rocket engines and adequate communications range to reach them, this is an opportunity I simply can't pass up. I've never sent something to the outer planets in realism overhaul before, and so these attempts are quite special to me, and I'm excited to see how they unfold. Cosmos 1 was intended to launch for Jupiter last year, before the landings took place actually. It used a conglomerate of new and unproven tech that led to practically every stage experiencing a failure of some sort. It never left Earth orbit, the mission had completely failed. But now, all three Cosmos spacecraft are successfully on their way to the biggest gas giants in our solar system. They are propelled from low orbits to their correct velocity by an upper stage, which Twitch chat has dubbed the Banshee Upper Stage, using two RL-10s, which happens to be more tech left over from the MXL and the Interim Icarus Pod program. As for the spacecraft, Cosmos 2 and 3, identical craft, are both en route to Jupiter, while Cosmos 4, a smaller, sort of different looking design, is on its way towards Saturn. The only correction maneuver needed to be performed on their way for all three of these is a small sub 200 meters per second inclination change at varying times in the future. And then also a sub 200 meters per second capture burn once they arrive. So it really doesn't take that much to get out there once they of course are on their way outside of Earth's gravity well. Their active mission will be to fly past and collect data from the numerous moons which reside in orbit of Jupiter and Saturn, respectively. 
but it will be several years before Cosmos 2, 3, and 4 reach their destination. And until then, RTGs power their batteries as they patiently wait, drifting through interplanetary space. Well, we've really bonked the trajectory of Hermes, but a geostationary network has begun with two brand new entries, and we have three probes heading for Jupiter and Saturn. As a reminder, this series is in all practicality a summary of what is streamed live on Twitch every week. So if you'd like to catch all the details than what is summarized here, head on over sometime, and it'll be good to have you there. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.